know, anything you could. Well, they have a good disaster zone at the house right now. I know. <laughs> Probably like close to what you have on the ground is what we have on the ground. Yeah. Without you having another one cut water, up. Too. There's more water. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Because right. I'm going to have no. And my roofers are going to be there tomorrow. So good. Last time, because I know already. Oh, okay. Well, I think some of it's because it's just a little bit. Well, hello. Tony, you're doing all right when you called me today and said, hey, they're going to be dropping off material. Yeah. 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 Before I forget, we got to remember. Did he tell you that we need to relabel one of the breakers because the one that's labeled sewer is not sewer? It's the one that's away from the sewer. The one that is the sewer is bedroom number two. It is definitely Hopefully, we'll remember. Chester? See that? Everybody's been telling me their duster said that. The duster looked at ours and said, Hey, you take nothing off. He's even better. Tell me, you better have a crew sitting out there. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 and they better have the equipment up front. They better have their harnesses and ropes before they get there. We started this snake handler church. Hey, you're on the We started this snake We practiced with the skins. Then we moved up to the real bottom. He was in my Zayla. He's even got his eyeball. I don't care. She's not coming in. I don't mess with those snakes. She had a real one. She'd be running herself. Dennis Beavers is in North Carolina. Yeah, I did that. Uh, and then, uh, 
because everything comes through and I don't have time to talk to but she was inside. She was going to be there. She was going to be there. She She was going to be there. 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 She was going to it's all on check that ever, so keep, ever tank of gas will come out of the chains all over gas and go back to the next day. It's going to be all over. We did do that. All right. We're going to crank her up. No, I didn't say you said you were sitting way there. You're going to find 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll pick up where we left off. I went off and left my Bible, so I'm using New American Standard tonight. Okay. That'll just throw me all off because nothing looks the same. I left my notes. I remember to bring the camera and the computer. I just forgot my Bible and my notes. Hey, I'm not going to edit it. Okay. Okay. What? All right, let's pray, and then we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again we can meet in the comfort of cool air, the nice chairs that we have here that you've blessed us with. We pray for those who are unable to meet with us. Uh, ask that you would be with them in their house repairs and their travels. That you'd keep them safe. Uh, help everyone for a speedy recovery from all that's going on. Lord, we thank you for those that are able to join us by the computer and pray that very soon we'll be able to see them here in our midst once again. We ask you to open our hearts, open our eyes, help us to see and understand what you would speak to us through your word tonight. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son and our only Savior. Your only Son and our only Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, we left off, and even though we looked into verse 7 last week a little bit, we're going to call ourselves having finished verse 6 uh, of chapter 4, 1 Peter. And we're going to start with verse 7, and we're going to... Not retreat, but we're going to back up just a little bit. We're going to dig in a lot more, and it's going to help us to go forward. Now, in Peter's day, remember that persecution is normal. We're not saying that it's right, but it's typical. It's normal. If you're a Christian, expect to be persecuted, especially because a true Christian is not going to offer any uh, any form of gift, whether it be prayer, sacrifice, praise to Caesar. They're just not going to do it. And so for that reason, they were ostracized from Rome. Uh, their, their early church Christians are followed around and pestered by the what we, uh, in the theologians call the Judaizers. That would be the Jews who claimed to be Christians who wanted to drag everybody back under the Mosaic law. And as far as Christ is concerned, we have been freed from the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law never saved. The Mosaic Law brought condemnation. It gave us hope because it pictured the salvation that was coming in Jesus, but not one drop of a blood of a bull or a goat or a dove or a ram of any of those actually cleansed anybody from any sin. Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And so uh, inspired by Satan in, in many of his court in, uh, persons, uh, some of them just confused, uh, say the Galatians, um, many of them were, were led or tempted to go back. And so there are many reasons for persecution in Peter's day, many reasons for lots of trouble, many reasons for lots of issues to deal with. And think of it on, on this end as well. We had a hurricane, well, we had COVID, hurricane, hurricane. If COVID didn't reduce the 
what's in the marketplace. The first hurricane did. And it's really bad when you can't find your orange juice when you go to both Walmart and Rouse's. <laughs> it's, I don't care what else is going on. When I can't find my orange juice, my Tropicana orange juice with lots of pulp in it, there's problems. I'll drink other orange juice, but when you go there and it's all empty, you're like, what the heck? Of course, that's not the only refrigerator thing that's empty. Now imagine that there is stuff there, but they won't sell it to you because you're a professing Christian. They, they faced that in Peter's day. You, you couldn't get hired on. People wouldn't do business with you. So there's all kinds of things going on. Last week, what we looked at in the earlier part of the verse, let's pick verse 3 for, for a good jumping start. It's going to become relevant here shortly. For the time past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. In other words, what is behind these things you should have left behind? Um, sensuality, lust, drunkenness. Uh, carousals, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Those things aren't past, but that was part of their past life. That's part of the society they were in. It's nothing in the Roman society for you to get off of work, go home, get plastered, and spend the rest of your day not knowing who you are, which way is up, beating your wife, beating your kids, scaring them, wasting your money you made that day. That was nothing unusual. That's how many of them lived because they had no hope. And the only way you can have hope is to have who? Jesus. That's it. There is no man-centered alternative that gives you a true hope. Well, if we just get a better president. Do you really have a hope in that? Do they make a better politician? I don't think there's a such thing as a good politician. Now, there was one from Missouri yesterday. He had some really good things to say about the Constitution, freedom of religion, and, and those that are grilling Amy Coney Barrett um, had some excellent things to say. But if he's, say he's a good politician through and through, he's a unicorn. You know, you're like, that they're rare if they even exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we looked into him long enough, I imagine we'd find stuff and be like, ah, that's just on one issue, he's good. The rest, he's got some other things that were like, Pfft. No, a good politician, that, it's just, it's, it's a tough thing uh, to, to wrap our mind around. And so if you keep looking for man's alternatives, what do you get? Well, let's get green energy. Well, how's that green energy working out for you in hurricane areas? <laughs> it's bad enough waiting for them to get power lines strung back up so we can get petrol fuel powered electric energy. Can you imagine having to wait for the sun to shine again? You no, know, Sunday and Monday was supposed to be really shiny. Them clouds just hung around. So if you went all green, your solar panels just ain't producing much. Well, some people's answer then is, but you got to have backup batteries. Okay, glad you brought up backup batteries. How are you going to recycle? Where are you going to put them in the landfill with all the other petrochemical byproducts you're upset about? See, everything that man does has a hiccup, has a hang-up. There's always something about our ways that are less than desirable. Always. Let's mine the moon. Oh yeah, like there's not going to be any ramifications from that. You know, we're going to go to Mars. We're all be dead by the time they mine something on Mars and get it back to help us. Man's, man's ways offer you no real hope. We're all going to eat vegetarian. No, we ain't. You know. That's some people's ways of solving the issues. But then everybody gets lethargic. We begin to have all kinds of health issues because we're not getting the right amount of proteins and carbohydrates that God has designed our bodies to use and to need. Man's ways are never good on their own. Jesus is the only one who offers true hope. And so in a Roman society where it's either Jesus or Caesar, many of them went with Caesar, even though they knew it was no hope, because at least with Caesar, I wasn't persecuted. So it's really bad to have to live in a system that you know is wrong, but the only reason you choose it is because of personal comfort, because then you get no comfort. Caesar's still on the throne. If he wants your kids, if he wants your wife, if he wants your land, guess what? He takes it. There's no hope in that. Jesus offers hope. And so all of these things that these people used to do, he says, that's time past. So when we come into verse 7 now, he, he's charging through with this line of reasoning that he's been doing. He says, the end of all things 
is at hand. Now, we, as we looked at that last week, we might be tempted to think Peter was mistaken because here we are almost 2,000 years later and the end hasn't happened yet. Man, if that's the end, can you imagine him saying, I'm almost through with my sermon? You'd be like, man, we're going to be here another eight hours, the way he counts time. <laughs> um, let's get into the mindset of Peter. Let's think Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 was very important uh, in the life of the disciples, very important in the life of Jesus and his teachings about the end times. Uh, many of you know it as uh, the Olivet Discourse. And in Matthew chapter 24, well, it's always fun looking in a different Bible because everything is not where you expect to see it. Let's see. <clears throat> 24 verse 1, Matthew. And Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. That sounds pretty dramatic, huh? Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The rest of Matthew 24, he explains every one of these things to them. Now to the Jew and a lot to Peter, the end of all things being at hand, you were about AD 62, AD 63, what's right around the corner? You know, Jerusalem's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem is right there. The writing is on the wall, the signs on the in the sky. Everybody knows what's coming. And in spite of the fact that you know what's coming, you can't stop it. It might be a couple of years away, but you're like, oh, this is going to be horrible. So life as they know it is about to come to a complete topsy-turvy, upside down, because the destruction of Jerusalem, whether you're Christian or Jew, Jerusalem has a very important aspect of our walk because of what it means to God in prophetic as well as past history. Jerusalem is God's capital. Even though Trump has acknowledged Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, Jerusalem is capital because God decreed it so, not because some man did. God's got plans for it. The Mount of Olives is going to be where Jesus returns, puts his foot down, and it, and it splits open. So for Peter, this end is coming now. This end of Jerusalem, things are getting worse. Uh, persecution is about them. There's much in Matthew 24 where Jesus talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, when you see these things coming to pass, if you're on the roof, don't even go inside. Think of the implications there. Who would be inside? Your family. Your kids. Other relatives. He says, you don't even go inside to get anything. When you see it coming, you better get and go. Because if you don't, what? You're going to get caught up in the destruction. Let that sink in. The destruction is going to be swift. The destruction is going to be severe. It's going to be entire. It's, it's going to be a totality to it, unlike anything they've ever experienced it before. The only way for you to escape is to be concerned about yourself and yourself all. Let that sink in. No time to grab your kids. Jesus even says, woe to those women who have children that are, are breastfeeding in those days. Because what's the natural inclination of the mom? You're going to protect the kid. But if you protect the kid, what's it going to mean? The death of both. That, you, that might be a tough call, but let that sink in. If I save one, we're both going to die. I can save myself, but I can't save anybody else. Woo. That's going to be a dramatic time. That's going to be a rough time. That is what's staring Peter in the eyes. He knows that's coming. He sees everything that's going on around. And so in the midst of that, you need to make a comparison. Is that what we're looking at? Well, it might be bad right now, but I don't think it's anywhere near as severe as what Peter was facing. We still have freedom of, of religion. I Look at us. We're, we're not concerned about violating any laws even right now other than maybe a COVID agreement or something that somebody else has made. Well, let's arbitrarily say everybody must be six feet apart. Oh, yeah, that works. <laughs> don't cough on nobody. Don't spit on them. Don't sneeze on them. And most people are going to be fine. <laughs> don't be drinking after somebody that ain't you. <laughs> See, there, the Lord has built into Luke a self-preservation. I don't drink after anybody but my wife. 
And if she slobbered too much, I don't drink after her. <laughs> I mean, I know some people, they don't care who drank from the bottle. Man, they just care who had the cup. They just do it. I won't even drink after my grandson, especially when they're little. You see what's left in the cup with little kids? <laughs> it's self-preservation. Not even even know it. The Lord's taking care of me. Lots of things that just use your mind, but slowly we're losing freedoms out. Don't forget, pray for John MacArthur's church. He is ground zero. He is taking the heat for all of us, and they are fighting back like mad. They're winning, but they became the focus because he was um, prominent enough that when he, his church met, he told them, you don't tell us what to do. God tells us what to do. In California, that set things off. And so there have been court fights, but God's been with them up to this point. So maybe for them, closer than we are, but we're free. We're free. People aren't waiting to taunt us. People aren't waiting for you when you get home. You as a church, boo, his. We've got lots of freedom still. We've We've got a lot that we would need to lose to be in the in, in the situation that they are. So if they're in this mindset and God's going to give them hope, how much more should that work for us? You know, if you're only a little bit sick, you only need a little bit of medicine. When you're going through big stuff, you need the big, big guns thrown at you. Here they are. They are going through what we would even call a fight for survival. Peter says the end of of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit. That's what the, in the, in, uh, the New American Standard reads. Um, King James says, be sober and watchful under prayer, right? We're going to look at that. Before we look at that, let's look at Romans chapter 13. And Paul very closely mirrors it to the Romans. In Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 11. Now I want you to see, eh? it's not that they colluded. They had the same Lord, the same Spirit guiding them when they wrote these things. Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 11. And this do, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Look at the similarities, what Paul wrote to the Romans and what Peter is writing to these fellow Christians. Put off what is behind, put on what is for the present. So when we look back at 1 Peter now, verse 7, the therefore of Peter is be sober, be of sound mind, be of sound mind. Judgment. Now, these two words in the King James, sober and watchful, are very close together. In fact, if you look at it and, and don't look hard, you're going to say, oh, they're just synonyms. They're just interchangeable. There are some words in our English languages that you can put two in place of the other and it doesn't make a hill of beans. But if you're true to our English heritage, there are nuances in other words, and so a person may particularly choose a word. It sounds close. It means almost the same thing, but there's just a little variation in it to give you an understanding. Mark chapter 5 uses this word in this way. Um, in the New American Standard, be of sound judgment. In Mark chapter 5, we're going to say we're going to see that it means to be of sound mind, to be in your rock mind. In Mark chapter 5, verse 15. And they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon possessed, sitting down, clothed and in his right mind. By the way, here's your, here's your joke for the election cycle, right? <laughs> The demon-possessed man is now cured, and he's sitting in his right mind. 
Obviously, he is not of the left. He is sitting in his right man. The left is demon-possessed. He is clothed and in his right mind. Now, you can get that better understanding by looking what it meant to be not in your right mind. He was what? Under the control of the demon. When you are sober, what are you not under control of? A demon, alcohol, food, anger, uh, led away by your appetite. It could be a host of things. I mean, some people, if they drink alcohol, like they drink Dr. Peppers or Cokes or things like that, they would be alcoholics. They have no self-control over these other drinks. And the only thing that the difference is, is the side effect. One will give you diabetes, another one gets you DWI. One of them may cost you your job. The other one will keep you away from your job if you do it bad enough and long enough. And there was an article. This, I'm so disconnected from the Internet right now. It's unbelievable. I don't even have a desire to get on and look around. Uh, I'd rather be out in the yard with a chainsaw and a rake. Um, there was a, a woman not too long after COVID started. She hit a, a, a diet drink binge and she drank like seven or eight of the big bottles in one day and it killed her well your body's not designed to handle that now she wasn't trying to commit suicide she just liked it well that's not being in your right mind something else is controlling you and so peter where he says be of sound judgment don't let something else control you now notice this next time someone wants to argue with you they're trying to get into your head and trying to control you. Let that sink in. They're going to throw out inflammatory words because if they can get you mad, they're going to get you off balance. If they get you off balance, you're an easy target to pick off. So you must stay in your right mind to be able to defeat them. Does yelling make you more right? Does screaming make you more right? No. In fact, if you want to really mess with somebody's mind, grin when you say what you say. Dude, you keep cleaving that way, you're going to bust hell wide open. It blows their minds because you know what you believe, and you've just said it. Now, some people might find it offensive that you might say it kind of jokingly, but you certainly didn't get in their face and throw down the gauntlet and challenge them because what happens is, and it happens to you, you know it, Sometimes you find yourselves arguing with people not over the issue, but simply because they got in your face, they made you mad, and you're going to fight right back. For long, you're not even sure why you're fighting back. Mm -hmm. You reach a certain part of the argument, you're like, how in the world did we get to this point? You're not in your right mind. You're not sober-minded. Something else has controlled you. And for some people, it's just, I've got to win the argument, so you take a side that you normally wouldn't take, a.k.a. our lawyers. They will defend people that they know are guilty just to win the case. Boy, when they stand before Jesus, they're going to get before a judge and a prosecutor that is not going to like that one single bit. Got to be right. No, you can be right and be wrong in every sense of the word. So to be of sound judgment, to be sober, to be in the right mind means when everybody else is blowing their top, losing their cool, and everybody else is freaking out, you remain rock solid. Go back to almost four years ago. What were we laughing at the day after the election? All of those people that went out and screamed at the sky because Trump won. Ah! Like, what's that going to accomplish? Screaming at the sky. You see, they had no hope. They couldn't turn to Jesus in prayer because they didn't have a relationship with Jesus to call him and say, Lord, what did we do wrong to deserve this? So they're going to go scream at the sky. You can find the videos on YouTube. They're crying. I can't believe it. I'm sitting there just like, wow. But that's people that have no hope in Jesus. Their hope was in man's system, the political system, and what they wanted when it didn't happen, guess what? They lose it. Okay, so we wake up, um, I don't even know what day it's going to be, November 8th, November 4th, 3rd, Wednesday after the Tuesday, if we even know there's a count. And we have Kamala Harris as president. 
It's going to be all right. Joe Biden ain't going to, he is not going to make it. He ain't even going to know he's president, even if he wins. He thinks he doesn't, he, he thinks he's running against Romney. His gaps are, are blowing my mind. So what if we get worst case scenario? Peter lived under Nero. And while we may have something that is distasteful to us, we don't have a narrow perspective. But are we going to lose our cool? Man, I'm going to go storm D.C. Go ahead. Huh? I said, what's that going to do? <laughs> what good is that going to do? Because according to the word of God, who raises up kings and who takes them down? See, that's the most fascinating thing about the sovereignty of God in man's voting. We think we've been in control. That's who we voted for. God says, that's who I gave you. That's right. that's it. And go study First Samuel. We want a king. That's it. I'll give you a king. Gave them what they wanted. Gave them Saul. They didn't like that. Later on, he says, now I'm going to give you a man after my own heart. He gave him David. Not that David was perfect, but David was leap years beyond what Saul was. Being of sound mind means I'm not controlled by the outside in, but by the inside out. So when we look at the next word, King James says, and watchful, some of your Bibles say, and sober spirit. Spirit's in capitalized because it is nowhere near the text. They inserted, they thought, oh, we're going to make this make more sense. Well, they did a horrible job there. So if you have spirit in your Bible, you definitely have my permission to take your pen and just scribble it out because it's already in italicized, which means they added it, has no purpose being there. But the watchful, even though it means to be sober in the same sense, the nuance is this. Not only am I not under control, but I am alert to what is going on. So we're not acting like nothing's going on. We're of right mind in spite of what's going on. I'm on guard for the right thing. You ask a lot of people what they stand for, you'll never get an answer. You'll hear everything they're against, but they don't know what they stand for. And it's because of the environment they're in. They're so used to pushing back, pushing back, pushing back. When you finally give them enough uh, chain on the leash to, to run free. They ain't got a clue what to do with it. They're so used to just pulling back. That's how they used to train the elephants. Put them on a short chain, short chain. They pull on and pull on, and eventually the elephant gives up. You leave the chain on and take it loose from the tree, and the elephant's not smart enough to, to go walking around because he thinks he's still connected because he feels that weight. What are you for? You know, we're against abortion. Okay, tomorrow morning we wake up. Abortion has been made illegal, outlawed, all abortion centers are closed. What are we going to do now? What do we do with all the signs that have been made? What about all the crisis pregnancy centers? They're not going to be having to convince women not to have an abortion anymore because we just eliminated that. Oh, what do we do now? No more October or November banquets, right, for life. What do we do then? Being watchful, being alert is going to give us a purpose. I want to be sober. I want to be of sound mind. I'm going to not be controlled or manipulated easily by everybody else. Things that are going out. You can plug alcohol into that as well because it makes such a good course. And if you go back in verse 3, that was part of it. They were having drunken parties. Um, typically speaking, a lot of people after they get real drunk do what? They go to sleep. So you're not under control of your own mind and then you're drowsy. How good would they be for watching and praying? No good at all. So rather, we're supposed to be of sound mind. That means we're not controlled by outside circumstances. And we're to be sober, alert. We're to be watchful. So that sober is why you could, why you could convince a drunk person or even this. How many people right after the storm, someone came in and gave them a bill of goods? Well, we'll clean your yard up, and they gave them some astronomical figure, and they're looking at destruction and think, I, that's what it's going to take. They're using panic mode. I think those guys ought to be skinned alive because they take advantage of people's nerves. They take advantage of not knowing any different, any better. Um, 
part of the way our government is designed and they're trying to make it work right now. Some people are getting frustrated with their insurance companies because they're not hearing back. Well, now you've got a number you can call. They have the numbers. They will make the person call you back. Our in Louisiana's insurance commissioner, they say, we'll make them call you. If we're not careful, insurance companies would love someone to just get so frustrated that they walked away. Why? Because with them, it's not about helping you. It's how much money can we save? That's what all of this is about. Even the, the contractor talking here, he said, yeah, there's going to be back and forth between us and the insurance company. They're going to try to save money and we're going to try to spend it. <laughs> and, and there's stuff that's got to be done. I'm thinking, build my church back. But not everybody thinks that way. Not everybody is, is trying to do what is good. Not everybody is trying to do what is right. And so if, say you're extremely sad. If any of you have a spouse, a loved one, or a friend died, the greatest thing you can do is invite me to go to the funeral home with you and let me do the talking. Because I have seen this on occasion. Wouldn't your loved one have liked this nice spray of flowers? What's their favorite flower? And they'll send you a 450 or 500 thing of flowers that are going to be gone in three days. I know how long they last because I mowed the cemetery and I had to throw them away when it was done. You don't want me arbitrating between him and the person because I'm like, listen, they're going to die. You can go to Rouse's and buy a thing of flowers for 40 bucks and do just the same. <laughs> But they tack all that on is because it's kind of like the little in and out marks. The gas isn't where they get you. It's all the extra little thing. Wouldn't your loved one like this little laminated, um, what's the, the thing out of the newspaper, the obituary? Wouldn't they have just loved this? Fine, stick one in the coffin. We're not going to pay 500 bucks to give everybody one. Let them go buy a newspaper and let them save it. And I guarantee if you go around asking people right now, for the most part, everybody who ever took one from a funeral, they ain't got a clue where it's at. There are a few people that save everything, they collect everything, and they're going to have everyone from every place they've ever been. But the majority of people, what do they do? Calvin, do, do I need to go rummaging through your attic up there, bro? Uh, do y'all remember a long time ago when the politicians used to stand outside the football stadiums? And they hand out a gazillion little cards. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, they're all going to be sitting in the stands when we're done. <laughs> now, a few people may have brought them home for whatever reason, but the most of them. <laughs> but the funeral home okay. is there to make money. Most of them are not concerned about your grief. They're going to tell you they are, but they're after money. There are a few, and I can tell you which ones to go to that you can get the funeral done for a half, at least half, of what the main ones are asking for. And if you really talk to them on the side, they're going to whittle things. They're going to make it comfortable for you financially because they're not in it simply to make money. They need to eat, but they're not after big dollar signs. And a lot of people are caught off guard. $15,000 for a funeral? Are you kidding me? Give me 300 bucks, we can go down to Lowe's. We can have this coffin built in just a matter of time. Yeah, but it needs to look all pretty. For what? We're sticking it in the ground in Louisiana. Yeah, we just could my daddy. It won't be there three years from now, it's going to rust. He's in the church. He's in a call of burial thing in the church. The Nutra rats are going to show up long before anything else. But they will put on the wouldn't your loved one love this? And they're trying to pull at your heartstrings. And whereas when I'm sitting at the table, you know, I've broken up a lot of those deals because it's just, you're tugging at their hearts. And I can tell you, in fact, I've even done a funeral where they said, isn't this lovely? No, it is not. This is not what your loved one wanted. And you know it. Mm -hmm. We sat at the same table. We heard what they wanted. You agreed to it. I agreed to it. And then they totally did so I told them, when it comes time to your funeral, I don't care if they put you up naked where everybody can see. You're going to get what you sold. You don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody really wants that, but my point being, my point being, if you're going to make agreements with people and you ain't going to stick to it knowing what your loved one wanted, why are you going to listen to somebody else trying to sell you a bridge in Arizona? 
Now listen, that's what the world wants you to believe. Listen, even if there is a God, what does he care about you? What difference does Jesus make in COVID? What difference does Jesus make in a hurricane? Because look at your church even. He hit your church. And he hit a lot of churches in Southwest Louisiana. <laughs> there, are, there are others that make us look like, man, we just had a little spring storm. They had the room. I mean, they got <sighs> sober mind and alert and watching because Satan is going to use all of these things to get you to react rather than respond. What's the difference between react and respond? How many of you did not have chemistry? Okay, y'all had chemistry. Oh, you didn't have chemistry? Y'all miss so You don't even know. Okay. How many of y'all been to the little kid science fairs at the elementary school? How many volcanoes show up? Because they demonstrate a reaction. If you put vinegar in baking soda, what happens? It's a reaction. It can't help it. And some people live their lives that way. They let the net circumstance or let the person's words cause a reaction rather than a response. A response means I have thought it through and I'm giving you an answer back. I don't just react. I don't just blow a gasket, blow a fuse, or sink into the corner and crawl in the fetal position and cry. Give a reasoned response. And we're told by Paul to always be ready to give a response to everyone that asks, why are you so hopeful? You're supposed to give them a response, not a reaction. Well, if you had been in church, you would know I'm so hopeful. That's a reaction. That is not a response. But yeah, we do that. A response is, let me tell you about Jesus. The night before he was crucified, he was praying in the garden, Father, if this be any other way, let it pass. If not, your will be done. He accepted what the Father brought into his life. And we know that because when he stood before Pilate, he didn't hurl accusations. He simply made the statement, you have no authority over me unless it's been given to you from above. He didn't yell. He didn't scream. He didn't pontificate. His words were very few. And yet his point was concise. People look for a reaction. Y'all have watched Matlock, Battle Davis. You've watched Law and Order. You've watched any of the criminal special victims units. They get the person on the stand. They find that little kink in their armor, and they begin to poke it, poke it, poke it, because if you can get them angry, then words flow out of their mouths, and if you get them the right questions, they'll answer it without even knowing to harm themselves. Because they reacted rather than responding. A Christian is not supposed to react to his circumstances. He's supposed to respond to them. Doesn't mean you're not in a hurry. I mean, the situation may call for some serious moving. But you're still responding rather than being reactionary. And what is the point? Be sound of sound judgment or be, of, be sober and watchful for what? For the purpose of what? Everyone in your Bible says what? Prayer. prayer. How many of your Bible says prayers? Agitates me to no end. Prayers is prayer. There's plural. It's prayers. You can, you can pull up any, any Greek you want. All the scholars will tell you that's supposed to be plural. Every one. I'm like, why in the world did y'all put it as prayer then instead of prayers? Because they're thinking prayer in general, but Peter's being prayers in specific. You're not supposed to be praying one time. You're supposed to always have prayers on your lips. You're supposed to always be in communion with the Father. You are always supposed to be talking to Jesus. Kind of like some people that talk to themselves. You're supposed to always be in communion with the Father. Now, how else are you going to stay in control? How else are you going to be sober-minded? How else are you going to be watchful unless you're talking with him all the time? How often do cops and firemen train? Well, it's, it's pretty much continual, never ending. Mr. Anthony, how many classes you got to go to every two or three years? It's relentless, isn't it? Constant training. The military, oh, they go to boot camp and that's it. They all just sit around and wait for a war, huh? 
be a lot of people joining the military if that's what it was. Pilots are constantly training. As they get more sophisticated with the, with the computer generated stuff, they put them in situations that you couldn't put a real airplane in, not safely. And they learn how to fight against the sideways winds, the downdrafts. They learn how to respond to them rather than react. And they train enough, they do it often enough and successfully enough that it becomes almost second nature. You don't even have to think about doing the right thing. You do it. Well, Jesus didn't wait till he got on the cross to just think about doing the right thing. When did he start? Well, he started back the first of his ministry. But specifically, the night before the crucifixion, he was on his face. He was praying unto his Father, not my will, but yours be done. And if we live in that circle every day, Lord, not my will today, but your will, and something catches you off guard, but if you've been in communion with the Father, well, I guess my will wasn't the way I'm supposed to go, and the Father's will is more important than mine. Now, the Father's will is not always convenient, and it's not always comfortable, but it's always right. Sometimes comfort leads us to make the wrong decisions. Sometimes convenience leads us to make the wrong decisions. Jesus was in complete Sober, alert mode. <clears throat> In fact, a lot of people, when they talk about Jesus not drinking of a specific cup in the Passover Seder the night before in what we call the Last Supper, a lot of them say, well, that's, that's this cup of Moses and this. I think they're missing the point. On the cross, even when he was offered the sour wine, what did he do? He rejected it. So much so that when he went to the cross, not a single person could say he's drunk. It was impossible. Jesus was under his own mind the entire time. And so if we stick with the, the truth of this, if anything else is inebriating your mind, you can't make sound judgments. If you're demon-possessed, you can't make sound judgments. The young man that was demon-possessed, he would cut himself. He was running naked through the cemetery. Some people call that a good time on a Friday night, but that's not normal. <laughs> they even knew that back then. That's not normal behavior. Nowadays, we say people that are cutting themselves, so they just have a psychological problem. No, they don't. They got a demon problem. Because Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's, oh, but their, their, their brain's out of chemical balance. You show me one chemical test they did. <gasps> Dopamine. They're overpowered in dopamine. You're not going to find one because there is no chemical test for chemical imbalance. It's not there. Every psychiatrist makes the judgment based upon his best understanding of the person, and they only make that decision based upon what? Having talked to the person. You put them before five different psychiatrists, and they can give you five different things that are going on. This does not dismiss PTSD. Soldiers coming back, having nightmares. I'm not dismissing that at all. But when you got kids cutting themselves, the problem is something spiritual. It is not a physical problem. Because destruction of the body is satanic. Jesus said, I came to give you life and give you life more abundantly. Well, when Satan's constantly tearing down, that ought to be one of our first clues. We need to pray about this. In fact, the disciples, Lord, why could we not cast this out? Jesus said, the answer is what? Prayer and Fasting. Ugh. That's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable. Oh, everybody can skip one meal. Right? I promise you, if you plan to skip only one meal, you're going to be as miserable for that one meal if you plan to skip it for three days. And if you've never done it, you, you have no clue what I'm talking about. But as soon as you try it, I'm telling you, I'm going to skip this one meal. Your, your flesh is going to challenge you. Satan's going to challenge you. And he's going to use everything. You're going to sit down and turn a TV on the computer. On. There's going to be every commercial that you ever see about food. <laughs> Veganism looks really good right now because you're hungry. I'll eat a tofu turkey if it makes me feel better. <laughs> you really have to be stretching then, huh? But the point being, we deny ourselves so that we become sober minded Deuteronomy chapter 8 God says I caused you to hunger notice God says I caused you Israel I caused you to hunger 
so that you learn that man doesn't live by bread only. Not that the food's unnecessary, but man's greatest need is not table food, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Now the word of God comes to you and says, I'm taking you to the promised land. Are you going to get there? Sure you are. What about the Red Sea? No, I'm going to the promised land. God, we're going to boogie board across the Red Sea or something. I'm in the wilderness. I'm hungry and thirsty. It doesn't matter if I've got water or food. God said he's taking me to the promised land. Guess what? I'm going to the promised land. Why are we standing around? Let's just go where we're supposed to be going. But that's not what happened. Especially when you get that many people in a group. A little bit of grumbling. And a little bit of grumbling. And what happens? We all know that. The best way, the best fun you can have when you see a little group and they're starting to grumble, inject nice stuff. Just be the killjoy. Offer them something hopeful. It destroys them. They just walk away from there. They totally can't be unhappy now because you've given them light and insight. No. Nope. Hey, it, it's great. I'm telling you, it's one of the, if you're of alert mind, you can just be a giant killjoy to the sad stuff they're talking about. That's better fun than getting them down is to ruin their getting down party. And if you are sober and you're alert and you've been praying, you can do that. Where is the hope in our circumstances? Where is the hope in what we're facing? What if Epsilon becomes a reality? Now I'm like, whatever. Bring it on. I don't care. I'll take an ice storm. There ain't a tree around my house going to hurt me. <laughs> and if you got trees around you that will hurt you and you ain't taking them down, that's your problem. That ain't mine. I bring an ice storm on. <laughs> Why not? God got his people through everything. Why can't he get us through everything? Oh, I agree. A night without air conditioning. Oh. Did you have air conditioning your first night after Hurricane Laura? You did? What about after Hurricane Rita? Oh, you don't know the pain of which I'm speaking then. <laughs> you need the first night after a hurricane in August or September when air outside. Do you remember how hot it was that first night? Oh. It was miserable. That was normal life for people before air conditioner came along. We had that thing on Clayton. Yeah. You know what? It, you know oh what yeah, it I remember was? growing up. Well, we didn't have. We were. I was like 16 when we got central air, and I thought that was like <laughs> it. You know. Sheila was. Yeah. Sheila was still going to an outhouse at the age of nine. Yeah. In Pennsylvania. Well, Tommy's grandparents that lived in Venera, they did not get indoor plumbing until 1985. <laughs> they were in a little shack. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We, we have leapfrogged ahead of the centuries the last 50 years. I mean, leapfrogged. And that's what causes most of our grief. Yeah. We forget, about it, what did it give us? we forget where we've come from. Mm -hmm. It's like, we were on our way tonight. She was like, oh, I lost my phone. I, I mean, I forgot my phone at home. Let you take mine. I don't care. It ain't going to work in here. I'm so used to now when I walk out of the yard and I leave it with Sheila. I ain't got time to answer a text every five minutes while I'm trying to cut. That's right. I don't work or a rake. Yeah. But so many people now, they're under control of their phone. If they don't have their phone, they feel naked. For one, but then they feel out of touch. I don't care if I'm out of touch. I still tell people, you text me at 1030 at night and it's important, shame on you. My phone rings, but it doesn't ding after 8 o'clock. It don't make a single notification sound. It'll ring all day long, but it won't go ping, whatever. I get 100 emails. I could be spammed and wake up the next day and be a thousand emails in my box, and I won't know until after six o'clock in the morning. I'm going to sleep. God's going to be awake. Let Him take care of me. Be alert. Be sober minded unto the purpose of prayer. This isn't just us saying, I can, I can, I can. No, it's turning our attention to the one who can. There's not a thing that you're going to face tomorrow that God's not capable of getting you through. In fact, God's quite capable of bringing a blessing to you that you didn't even see coming, if you'll follow him. Comments or questions? I'm out of time.
Wednesday nights go by so quick. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain in that interview you were saying about laying into the mountains and the house up? Mm hmm. Kind of Let's see, that verse is. Uh, that's down to verse um, 16. Let, then let those who are in. This is Matthew 24, verse 16. Then let those who are in Judah flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go, go, not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Let whom he was in the field not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in that day. Pray that your flight be not in the winter or on a Sabbath. Self preservation. Think Lot's wife. Destruction behind her and what she do. She looked back to the destruction rather than fleeing the safety. And Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. That's, that's, you think, well, that's cold. No, that's how bad it is. Y'all have watched some of the end of the world movies and then they're going to kill us by tsunamis in every way. And there are people, oh, look, the wave's coming. Oh, look, the wave's coming. Look, if it's coming after you, run. Standing there and acknowledging it ain't going to do you a a darn thing, take off running for your life, grab something that's going to float, kick the person next to you so you can fight one of them. You need something that's going to keep your head above water. But standing there looking at it ain't going to fix a single thing. But that's something, and it sounds cold. He says, if you're in the field, now who would be in the field? The husband. Where would the wife be? At the house with her little garden making bread and watching the kid. He says, if you're in the field, don't even go back. Now, to our sensibilities, that's cold. No, that's reality. Imagine waking up in Germany the next night after the fence was built. Families were split overnight. And if you tried to rescue them, what happened? You got killed. Trust the Lord and do what is the right thing to do. There are so many things that offend our sensibilities today. God, I know God just shakes his head. Have y'all not read my word? I wish we went back to swords instead of bombs. Because it was man against man. Bombs scare people. Some people find comfort in bombs because it won't get to you. I mean, it's instant. Can you imagine being stabbed? It was brutal. Why couldn't David build the temple? Blood on his that's exactly what God said. You're a man of bloodshed. Well, well, God called him to defeat the enemies. You're absolutely right. But he still couldn't build the temple because he was a man of great bloodshed. After every battle David was in, you know he had to go home and wash the blood off his hands. That world wasn't sterilized back then. It wasn't, oh, hit reset and start the game over did not exist. There were no reboots unplugging your router and plugging it back in. Uh-uh. It was real. It was a whole different time. He says, don't go back. It, if you do, you're going to get caught up in destruction. That, that's how severe, and his point was, that's how severe what's about to come on you was. And it was so severe that what the church didn't willingly do, disperse, God forced them to do and when they all took off running, they took the gospel with them, and thus the world was evangelized. Okay. No more questions? I always tell somebody, you know, if somebody's asking, if you've got a question, somebody else is thinking it, they're just not asking it either. All right, let's pray, and I'll go look and see if they got one over there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Help us to think about these things. Lord, the news wants to scare us. Commentators want to scare us. People on the radio want to scare us. And for most of the secular ones, Lord, they're, they're offering no hope in Jesus. And Lord, many of those who are supposed to be giving us hope in Jesus are failing at that as well. Help us to remember what Peter is telling us here. We are to leave the past behind. We're to be sane, sane sound-minded right now. We're to be on alert, on guard, watchful, so that we may seek you in prayer. 
God, help our prayer to be thoughtful. Help it to be purposeful. Help it not to be just something we do to get out of the way to say that we did it, but help us to yield our mind up to you that we may be prepared for the days which are upon us. Be with us as we go through the rest of this week, and I pray that this coming Sunday morning that you would return a whole host of Westsiders that we may sing and celebrate your praises together. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lots of heart. It's supposed to be coming tomorrow.